Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. The June solo show coming at you a third of the way through July. So, a little bit late, uh, as is the, I guess, delivery of this episode by a few hours, but we can maybe chalk that up to Mars Retrograde. A few other things, I actually, uh, <laughs> I wanted to get a couple of blog posts out this week, but actually spent too much time thinking about this show instead. Also, I watched The Extended Hobbit the whole way through. Uh, more on that in a bit, but uh, that took up a, uh, a rather large amount of time. But um, I guess what I wanted to discuss is sort of pushing further on some of the things Connor and I chatted about, uh, moving it into essentially the realm of technology. And I guess I can begin with, you know, farm news and technology, uh, the guest house is coming along and it's getting to the point where I can finally furnish it. Uh, so there's been, after maybe next week, there'll be room in my head for first thoughts on how we can, I guess, retro suburbanize the actual farmhouse that we live in um, from next year. Obviously, as it makes sense, um, the plan is slash was to spend money on the things that can make us money, which is the guest accommodation, so that we have money <laughs> to do the things we want to the main house. And these are sort of, you know, heating flue systems, cool cupboards, um, wood stove, wet back combinations, optimizing the existing solar setup, you know, all the kind of stuff that uh, I chatted with David Holmgren about. So this episode is kind of there. Uh, it's about being in the world and technology and how we might better think with these notions, I guess, given, you know, how everything is going. Um, and I get one of the ones that I'm a little bit obsessed with at the moment is cool cupboards and, and cool cupboards in a world where essentially secret space programs are coming to light. Now, Permaculture uses words like energy descent and low energy future. But do you know what a cool cupboard is? I, I've been thinking about this. It's not low energy. It's free energy, right? So how they work, you essentially dig a trench a meter deep uh, and somewhere between 10 and 20 meters long. And you put the pipe in the trench and cover it back up. And that pipe emerges into a sealed cupboard, obviously, hence the name in your larder or kitchen or what have you. And this is this is where you keep, you know, your food cool. So it's a refrigerator replacement. But it's not even that. Uh, first of all, if you think about refrigeration technology, even though they now do things like text you or email you if you're out of milk and uh, have ice machines and, and water and so on attached to them, the kind of baseline understanding of what they're for hasn't changed since the mid-20th century. But this is a bit odd, but it may not look like it at first, but a cool cupboard, because it's free energy, possibly has more... I guess, metaphysical similarities with whatever or however the electrogravitics work in a Lockheed Martin flying saucer than they do, you know, with the mid-20th century refrigeration unit. Uh, because they are both harmonized with how the universe structurally works, right? That's how it's free energy. I mean heat is lost in the cool underground, so that air that comes through is permanently cool, and it's free energy. It's not low energy, because you are harmonized with how the universe functions, right? And I guess the genesis for this episode was thinking about that, and watching The Hobbit for several days, <laughs> and also a a piece on transhumanism and the billionaire future by Douglas Rushkoff that I shared to the Facebook page a few days ago. And it kind of rightly points out the complete failure uh, of the ridiculous transhumanist billionaire worldview uh, 
in that they don't even think they can affect the outcome of the world that they, in fact, created. And so I have a quotation from it, which is germane. So I'm just going to read this out from my notes, and, uh, and then we'll talk around it a bit. The event. That was the euphemism for the environmental collapse, social unrest, nuclear explosion, unstoppable virus, or Mr. Robot hack that takes everything down. This single question occupied us for the rest of the hour. By the way, side by the question Rushkoff was asked by these billionaires was essentially how do they maintain control over their security force in a collapsed society when they're living in their bunkers. They knew armed guards would be required to protect their compounds from angry mobs. But how would they pay the guards once money was worthless? What would stop the guards from choosing their own leader? The billionaires considered using special combination locks on the food supply that only they knew, or making guards wear disciplinary collars of some kind in return for their survival, or maybe building robots to serve as guards and workers, if that technology could be developed in time. That's when it hit me. At least as far as these gentlemen were concerned, this was a talk about the future of technology. Taking their cue from Elon Musk colonizing Mars, Peter Thiel reversing the aging process, or Sam Altman and Ray Kurzweil uploading their minds into supercomputers, they were preparing for a digital future that had a whole lot less to do with making the world a better place than it did with transcending the human condition altogether and insulating themselves from a very real and present danger of climate change, rising sea levels, mass migrations, global pandemics, nativist panic, and resource depletion. For them, the future of technology is really just about one thing, escape. Then a little bit further down, the more committed we are to this view of the world, the more we come to see human beings as the problem and technology as the solutions. As the solution. The very essence of what it means to be human is treated less as a feature than a bug. So, I mean, it's a good piece. You'll find it on the Facebook page if I forget to put it in the show notes for this episode. Uh, or you could just Google Douglas Rushkoff Medium, and it will I can't remember the name of the article offhand, but it will show up. And it fascinates me because it is one of those idiotic mutations that emerge if you situate yourself in this kind of materialist, loss-only, um, dead universe. And and this is where the Hobbit part of it comes in, right? Because these billionaires who have more or less contributed in an outsized way compared to, say, us, to the challenges that we're currently looking at, don't think they can fix it. And the Hobbit part is how you incorporate the big and the small. Because the big... The big is not just the macro politics. So I know in the newsletter and in, in some of the previous posts and so on, it's been discussing how you be in and activate in the world given what's going on. But it's more than that. It's uh, we've arrived at the reality, or I think actually more likely, unveiling of what was previously a clandestine secret space program. So humans are or are about to be multiplanetary. And it seems to me the key to incorporating the big and the small. So big political changes, massive uh, ontological changes in what a human even am, and what you can do about or with these changes. And the key there, of course, is in the humanness, and then eventually, which we will, of course, come to, the personness. So um, watching The Hobbit was how I treated myself, I guess, after the Greek magical papyri course finished up. Probably should have just gone to Hobart and, and gone on a bender, because it really did take most of the, me of the week. Those films are very long. But... You know, I got to watch the whole thing sitting by a roaring fire in the middle of winter, drinking port with snow on the surrounding hills. And for a Tolkien nerd from the subtropics like me, I can't tell you how much that felt like living my best rural life. So I'm generally happy with <laughs> how I spent my time over the last three or four days in that sense. And um, 
They're better films than I remembered. Uh, I watched, I watched all the extended ones, obviously, and I'm not even sure if I'd seen the final one extended before, which I guess seems like a weird oversight for someone, you know, who's been to Tolkien's grave multiple times and has written about it and so on. But something occurred to me, which kind of brought it back into alignment with Peter Jackson's original trilogy, The Lord of the Rings, because there are some things, not many, but there are some things that he, in fact, does better than Tolkien. And uh, Bilbo's story, because obviously you have to fit the character journey, and this is one of the shortcomings, but it also occasionally and accidentally produces something better. Um, Peter and Fran have a really kind of classic or textbook understanding of a screenplay and the beats in the screenplay. So it um, sometimes that gets quite clunky when they're trying to find motivation or MacGuffins or something, but sometimes it works. And it's a bit clunky in terms of like Gandalf's motivation in the three films, which has in fact always been a problem with The Hobbit. Um, prior to the movies, once Lord of the Rings came out, that's that's one of the literary criticisms. It's like, well, hang on, why is this guy going on a treasure hunt if all this other stuff <laughs> is in play? So they try to kind of shoehorn some motivation in there, and it doesn't quite land as well as it should. Um, the Bilbo stuff does, at least in the second film. And it offers, I guess, almost uh, strangely on point teachable moments for situating that activism and, and optimism and magic and, and all that kind of stuff in 2018. Because Bilbo does really small things that have outsized fate impacts, if that makes sense. And they're, and they're against the backdrop of big, sweeping changes to history. Now, it loses, a, loses it a bit in the third film, but you notice it the most in the second. And it is, it is structurally different to, like, action film heroes' journeys, where it, it does, where eventually the hero kind of, he or she gets into a position of increased agency or power. Uh, and and alters the fate of the world. So, if you like, take Luke Skywalker as an example in the original um, Star Wars film. So he goes from farm boy through training up to actually doing a one on one battle with the bad guy. Bilbo doesn't. Um, he doesn't kill the dragon or any of that kind of stuff. The other thing that I think makes it, and we'll come back to how that's important and, and what those small things that have outsized fate impacts are. But I think, and I'm not sure if this was intentional or it's just because I saw it and I'm thinking these ideas. Um, he can't understand what's going on. It's not that he doesn't. It's that he literally cannot. And not even in an elitist sense. Like he has no conception of what Gandalf, for instance, actually is, which is one of the Maya in possession of an elvish ring, right? So, and it just seems to me that this is sort of literally how magic works. If you do it often enough, you reach the realization that we all just sort of work here. Um, note that, I guess, that do what you can, but be humble about your understanding implication of Bilbo's interactions with the world even applies at a Maya level. Like in, you go to fellowship and Gandalf says, even the very wise cannot see all ends. And that's sort of the key. Uh, it sounds simple, but it isn't. It is in fact really profound. And that profundity is, well, that message is less heavy-handed in the Hobbit films than in the Lord of the Rings ones, where you kind of get that clunky dialogue about how even the smallest person can change the course of the future and so on. That's, that's more in the Luke Skywalker vein, right? Uh, but the small things outsized impacts human scale or Hobbit scale is, is better treated filmically 
uh, in The Hobbit. Because The Lord of the Rings has other themes to go after, right? Okay, so whatever. They are better films, but this is what we're talking about now. Because <laughs> when you look at 2018, if the billionaires can't stop it, uh, you're not going to stop these things, at least not in the way you imagine them. And this is kind of where the discussion about technology, which we'll come back to, overlaps with the episode uh, with Connor. The implications of a improved or better suited worldview are... Uh, these forces and these ideas flow through humans. They aren't generated by them, at least not entirely. So there's a kind of Jungian angle to that, right? Which is that, you know, um, thoughts have humans rather than humans have thoughts, at least in part. And to keep it in the realm of fantasy, you, in Earthsea, that's kind of the message of magic um, that Le Guin depicts as well, right? So that you are... Uh, and it's power, and power is, is a kind of external agency or intrinsic agency in the universe that th flows through humans, and that flow is risky. So her kind of Taoism is showing about what you do about power and flow and those things, which is one of the reasons the books are so remarkable. This will all become relevant when we circle back to technology. But just to finish up talking about scale and effective change and politics, and delusional thinking. Middle Earth has yet more to teach <laughs> on that matter, right? If you look at countries in the West, or really anywhere, there's essentially one corporate party in charge. And none of the important stuff is ever tabled for discussion. So, obviously, in the US, you have both supporting the expansion of imperial wars and military budgets and doing bank bailouts and drone strikes and surveillance and austerity and so on. So, the cosmetic differences across the mainstream parties are kind of like giving a baby something to distract it while you're trying to talk on the phone. So... And this, this message is baked into the Lord of the Rings, particularly in the films. So jumping back to Fellowship, Gandalf says, there is only one Lord of the Rings, and he does not share power. Too many people still seem to think he does. And I know that it, especially if, especially if you haven't sat with this, it sounds insulting. but. You, you have to sit with it. Like when I, when I look at people who think that you can actually solve Sauron by being Sauron, I honestly just see your failure to accurately identify the situation or a failure to learn the lessons of history or both. And a little bit of megalomania, frankly, because we know, historically, we know those ways just do not work. And the other thing that we know historically is the Bilbo approach, doing what you can at your scale, that might be the only effective or at least lasting means of change. Because what you get in The Hobbit in particular, but also in Lord of the Rings, and contentious though this may be, as previously mentioned, more so in the films than the books, is an exploration of the butterfly effect, before there was any such term, just to keep it chaos baby, right? Um, the Gandalf line, the pity of Bilbo may rule the fate of many, yours not least. And what that means is the small actions having outsized impacts. And this is a ecosystemic, chaotic cosmology. And... And also a guide for how to be in it in an effective way, rather than a low-resolution, totalitarian, arconic, Mordorian one of forcing what you understand change to be, because there is there's a real intellectual risk there, right? It, it presupposes that you absolutely know what's going on, and you do not. And um, 
this and thinking about this, and this is kind of why I turned it into a post about well, a solo show and a post about technology and everything else is the human scale action and morality thing also works on the grander scale when you think about it. So what is a general in the Pentagon, but a human in a workplace? So the small scale humility before action and understanding applies even if you can destroy whole countries with the push of a button. Right? And that, that applies to you and your workplace because fairly certain generals in the Pentagon don't listen to the show. Um, I'm sure someone there does, but uh, not generals. And I guess that brings us back to technology and a, a meditation on how we situate technology in activating and just generally being in the world in 2018. And in a way... <laughs> You can find this in The Hobbit too, um, as the One Ring, particularly uh, the technology we're going to talk about. So there is it's, the One Ring is especially for Bilbo, but actually anyone, because when it was made, it tricked all the great and the good in Middle Earth. Is this? It's a Roswell incident. It is a technology that is beyond the understanding of every other living being, right? Here's the thing when it comes to, and this is important because if we're talking about how we be in the world and digital surveillance platforms and, and looking for authenticity and, and, and embodying change, if your science of mind is not up to code, then your understanding of technology is going to be in the toilet. So let's use a, you know, Fairly simple and unproblematic example. Let's talk about AI. Now, criticism or promotion of AI is kind of caught in this infinite loop. The contention, I guess it is, that we will one day assemble sufficient complexity so that an AI will spontaneously develop a human version of self-awareness, which is the current cornerstone in the definition of consciousness, self-awareness, as we understand it as humans. Well, that contention is patently wrong straight out of the gate, obviously, because it presupposes the materialist contention that consciousness is a quirky but stable emergent capacity of matter. Fine, agreed, obviously. That is, like, that version of it is silly. But particularly when it comes to quote-unquote objects, and particularly when those objects are technological or can impact the world in some way, there are other, potentially better, and at the very least, I guess, useful ways of thinking with the notion of AI. And this is sort of something we also, I guess, fail to do typically right out of the gate. We examine when we're looking at, say, uh, non-enlightenment, rather I was going to say non-Western, but that's not correct, non-enlightenment conceptions of humanness and personality and all the rest of it. We look at what are serious and truthful understandings to others without them being serious and truthful to us. So obviously when we're talking about objects and, and non-human persons and so on, you have sacred objects, inspirited statues, uh, you know, tribal inherited talismans, evidence of and conceptions of and, and real understandings and, and demonstrations of agency in the more than human world. But we look at it, and, and they are. These are serious and, and truthful modes of being. And then when we look at them, we do it in a way that breaks any potentially authentic mode of thinking with non-human personhood 
by porting that even conceptualization is the wrong word even even trying to describe it i'm doing this by porting that conceptualization into a materialist naturalist framework where our scientific truths about what consciousness or object or person or technology are, these aren't relative. So we know what they really are, but non-Western truths are relative. So just by trying to bring it into the way we think in a way into it so that we can demonstrate or at least explore these sort of non-Western ways of thinking with these notions with a view to improving our wider understanding, we break it. It's sort of like trying to light a candle underwater. If you try to port into, if you relativize something so that it may port into a system where your framework for truth is not relative, you'll break it. Now, when that comes to AI, well, this, the AI, I think, is a very good example of this. Uh, but when it comes to AI, we suffer from the same, and this is related to what I mean, the same challenges in conceptualizing or thinking with cognition that Eduardo Cohn explores in How Forests Think, which is his book. Um, following the Enlightenment, we decided that humans are the only things or organisms or whatever that communicate. So we went looking out in the natural world, which again is another imperial distinction, natural, not natural world, natural, cultural, and so on, for examples of communication or language specifically, language specifically in, in Cohn's case, um, that look like ours and not finding any, decide they aren't there. And it's this bizarre mind trap or mind loop, right? Because the thing is, we aren't the rule. We are the exception. That's Eduardo Cohn's point, uh, which is derived from his time spent among the Runapuma in particular in the Amazon. Everything in the forest thinks and communicates. And humans do it in a singular way. So we are the exception rather than the rule. And if you, if you go looking for the exception, you miss the rule. Uh, Terence McKenna uh, once said, I forget where, but to search expectantly for a radio signal from an extraterrestrial source is probably as culture bound a presumption as to search the galaxy for a good Italian restaurant. And this, when it comes to what even am AI, what does communication and personhood look like, is the exact same challenge. This sort of similarly erroneous thinking, often, but certainly not always. There's some good stuff in AI discussions around this, but certainly not always, but it very often accompanies AI discourse. When we should be situating ourselves in a more holistic and less anthropocentric is the wrong word, but it's not too wrong that I can't use it. So I guess a less anthropocentric vision of, you know, cognition and agency and communication. By a Conian definition, AI already exists. Think about that. Uh, and, I mean, use that thought to think with other technologies and algorithms that are embedded in your life today. These forms have agency, and they have communicative ability in the sense of pattern recognition and response, which is the baseline for communication in uh, in the sort of how forests think way of being. It's just that we do stuff symbolically in a, in a different sense, right? Um, so by a, by a Conian definition, AI, which can, which has agency and can do communication and pattern response and mimicry and all that kind of stuff, exists. So think about other technologies and algorithms, very basic algorithms that have agency and that recognition capacity that are embedded in your life today. What I've been trying to get across in general, and uh, it's obviously an ongoing project, <laughs> uh, 
regarding the big table animism idea. And apologies to the premium members coming to the Melbourne drinks next week if you end up with an animist ice cream headache because we're at a pinch point in in how this could potentially play out. Um, what I've been trying to get across is that this isn't mere whimsy. This isn't talking to your tomatoes, which you should still do based on the dozen or so studies that suggest it improves their fruit setting. So uh, it's it's not an either or. But what we're looking at here is something different as a kind of baseline reconfiguration of how we think with stuff like AI. What would AI development look like if some of them, some simple AIs, already are persons and some of them can satisfy that description? Um, I've had an AI, I've, I've said this story before, I've had an AI um, invent a salad that I ate in New York, you know. Um, but how does the future unfold? Not just the technological future, because again, that's one of those sort of nature culture distinctions which we're about to come to. How does the future unhold, unfold if we situate these areas of inquiry in a non materialist, non naturalism wo um, world or mode or something? So, um,. That's hobbits and animism, in a way. Uh, space programs. Secret or otherwise, I guess. Um, some of this kind of thinking has been rolling around in my head since I got back from the desert and, you know, I had listened to Richard Dolan's presentations and, and you know, Catherine Fritz, of course, going through the numbers of the um, 20 plus trillion that's missing and, and the coming step by step through the legal changes that happened over the second half of the 20th century, that is this kind of open and shut, very obvious case of harvesting taxpayer money and, and tipping it into a black budget world as a result of some mid 20th century event. And we're kind of seeing all that stuff come back out, right? Um, so what even am technology and AI and, and so on gets folded into it? But I kind of go in and out on whether or not some days I think we probably are multiplanetary based on the 70 years of unlimited funding research that uh, appears to have just happened. And if we're not multiplanetary yet, we will be soon, like probably in our lifetimes. Do you think differently about being human? Now that we either are or will soon be multiplanetary, is there a ontological shift in the human? Now that we are properly spacefaring, not bullshit spacefaring, like look at us, we went to the moon or whatever. And when we think about this, kind of comes back to the cool cupboard and uh, and Raytheon flying saucers or whatever, right? When we think about the notion of appropriate technology, and this is one of the challenges I want to, and I'm arranging some discussions in the permaculture world to have, we think about low energy. We think about energy descent. We think generally about, how to describe this, I guess, like Im appropriate technology brings to mind images of water wheels, Locally sourced compost, fences made of driftwood, and, you know, some that sort of thing. And that's all true. I mean, they are all instances of appropriate technology. They just won't get you to Mars. So what happens? What if we stack the understanding that thoughts and forces have at least some independent existence that can either, however you want to conceptualize it, like erupt um, from within your unconscious and for you to be how those things play out. What do we situate that idea behind a wider understanding of intelligence and personhood that need not look so human and itself has some level of agency? So what if we do 
what if we put the kind of young stuff behind the the current stuff, and then I guess like cast our eyes out at the future and see if it looks more positive than a billionaire bunker future. Does it look like electrogravitic space shuttles shuttling between at least two planets existing in local commons agricultural contexts that include water wheels and driftwood fences? I mean, it does to me. I think appropriate technology is not low technology. I think it's appropriate. I think it literally includes electrogravitic spacecraft and driftwood fences. For about a decade, I guess now, because it's 2018, um, I've been beating the drum for using technology to fulfill or express the analog. And I did this to, you know, tumbleweeds at, uh, when I had a proper job at various London media events. But they're coming around, and, and we're all coming around. And here's the thing about using technology to fulfill or express the analog. Thoughts are analog. At least the ones that we experience, by definition. Um, you know, androids and electric sheep, maybe not all thoughts are, right? Personhood, in general, and your specific personhood, is or are, I forget what tense I'm in, extended into the digital and technological domains by default. This is 2018. That's just how things are, right? These domains, where we spend most of our time, are military and, co and commercial surveillance platforms assembled for effectively the worst possible agendas. And that is your context. You are in the US military. Your agency and personhood is extended into and intertwined with it. That's your context. What we need... Well, no, let me say this another way. Having better ways of thinking with this reality can get us past the false binary of technology, yes or no. It is the place to begin, obviously, because here is where we are, and the opportunity to allow better thoughts and forces and connections to express themselves. So this is the having technology fulfill the analog. Um, you can make analog tech connections using technology is, a, is one example. But if we also want to get to like electrogravitic spacecraft and driftwood fences, here's the thing. You are in possession of the One Ring. Bring it back to Bilbo and the weird, dangerous technology. You're in possession of the One Ring. Try not to use it. Sometimes you're going to have to use it. And also, it's yours. Like, this is your context. This is where you found yourself. The appropriate technology loop just to keep it with the Hobbit. That actually might, not, might be quite a good example to, or quite a good image maybe to, to finish up this rant on is, yeah, it is. Okay, good. I bought the Hobbit trilogy on Google Play. So there we go. <laughs> Embedded in that US military surveillance context, right? And streamed it at the edge of the world. And... It is the majority inspiration for this show that you, will, you are now invited to consider how and where you are listening to as another real-time example of being embedded in that context for, hopefully, I certainly do my best, enriched analog experiences. So appropriate technology does not mean low technology because of my allegedly fancy Google Play, Edge of the World, subsequent podcast setup. I think, so if it doesn't, let me start that again. Appropriate technology is not low technology, not necessarily, but I think it probably has to mean haunted technology in some sense. And I think developing a workable understanding of 
technology and agency is an appropriate step in assessing the scale and implications of the various challenges and opportunities we are living through at this point in the timeline. I think we all need to find our way, and it will be different on a you know context-by-context context basis. We all need to find our way if there is a scale agency activation activism teachable moment in Bilbo Baggins. We all need to find our way of becoming fully extended Bilbos, which is a strangely sexual image that that I'm going to end on. Until next time.